Well, hello there. Here we are again this week, uh, taping our service. We're doing it actually on a Thursday night as we uh, look forward to a weekend of deer hunting and encourage you to be praying for that as we think of things to pray for too, for the safety in that regard. As we begin today, just a reminder of things upcoming this week, um, full slate of things this Wednesday. Uh, this Tuesday evening, I believe, is a uh, at um, 6 o'clock or 6.30 is the... Uh, a training. If you'd like to come and um, learn how to do the sound booth, we would love to have a number of people do that um, on Tuesday evening. Wednesday is a full slate of things. And as we look at the week ahead, there's uh, a lot of things to be praying for. We think of our nation now as we pray and with the uh, election and waiting to find out on that. Maybe by the time you watch this, things will be settled a bit too. But I encourage you, whatever way the um, things turn out, to be praying for those that are our leaders. And we are called to do that in Scripture. We are called to pray for them, and they are the authorities over us, and we are called to, uh, to uh, be thinking of them and asking that they would follow the Lord in what is done. Um, also, I just want to remind you that uh, the next two weeks here, this week and next week, if you would like to give towards the military Bible stick, um, these MP3 players that can go to the uh, service members, um, they are $25 a piece that you can uh, donate for that. And if you'd like to do that, just make your check out to either Rose Free Lutheran Church or Spruce Free Lutheran Church, and then we'll send in um, uh, that set of money after these next two Sundays. We'll give a couple Sundays to be able to do that. You can be in prayer. I want to give you one other testimony from that. Uh, we will show a video in the actual service um, with regards to things. We can't do that with the online thing here, but... Uh, this is from a guy that is uh, E5 in the Army. He says, The military Bible stick goes with me everywhere. I listen to it at least four times a day. It keeps me sane, calm, and in good spirits. Most importantly, it aligns me with the Lord's will. And so I'd encourage you as we do that to pray uh, for our service members. Uh, this coming week is now um, Veterans Day will come up on the 11th. And I would encourage you to be praying for our veterans. We're thankful for you that are veterans. If you're a veteran at home listening to this, we want to know that we want to thank you. And we're praying for you as veterans. For those that are in active service, we are praying for you as well. And we would like to honor you in that way today. Let's start with a word of prayer. And then we'll start by singing a patriotic song, but also a song that asks that we would follow God's ways and that God would mend our every flaw in that way too. But let's pray first. Lord, thank you for the gift it is just to talk with you, to pray, to come before you. And uh, we do lay the things before you that are in, in the midst of our nation right now. The, the COVID spike that we feel in the county here and the many people that are, number of people even within our church body who are now uh, tested positive, we pray for their health in that regard. We pray that you'd continue to watch over us and to bring healing to hearts and bring healings to people that are feeling those physical ills that have come upon us. We uh, pray as well for our nation with the election. We pray that uh, your hand would be upon things and that you would be upon our leaders and our, our president, whoever that may be here. We uh, ask for your, your hand upon their life and that you would watch over them. Lord, we um, pray these things in your name and we pray... As we go forward, we pray and thank you for the people who have stepped, put, put themselves in the path of harm's way for us by, by fighting and uh, protecting us by being a part of our military. We lift them before you. We pray for our many uh, um, veterans who have done so in the past, and we pray for those that are active duty right now too. We lift them before you, and we thank you for the sacrifice that many have made so that we can have freedom to meet together here. We pray these things in your name, Jesus, and we look forward to what you have for us um, as we do this service today. Do your work in our hearts. Again, I just pray, Lord, knowing that you can do that. In your name, Jesus, amen. Let's uh, sing our first song. It's America the Beautiful, and if you'd stand up at home as we do it, but let's sing it out as we uh, think of what God can do. This is a prayer as well. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. It is good to sing songs like that and to be reminded. And uh, we have the American flag up here in our church and we have the Christian flag up as well. And it's good to be reminded that um, we have a nation that's founded under God. And so we want a nation that will follow him. And in so many ways, we have turned from him. And we pray that, again, our nation would once again humble themselves and continue to pray and to ask for God's guidance. Speaking of God's guidance, one of the things we can do all the time is turn to him because we are sinners. We are, have flaws, as we just sang in the song. Um, we ask him to mend those flaws. But the biggest thing we ask is that he would forgive and bring forgiveness from our sins. So we ask you, and you'd join me, if you would, please, that we would confess our sin, that we'd turn from our sin and repent and look to the Lord alone as we go forward. So join me, if you would, with the confession you find on the screen here today. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading today is the scripture reading of the text that we'll be using as we come back to Zechariah and continue on in Zechariah. I'm going to read all of chapter 12 for you and then the first six verses of chapter 13. As Zechariah continues on here, and this is the second oracle or the second message that he gives to the people after the visions and then the first oracle, now the second, second one here. But beginning at verse 1 of chapter 12. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. 
The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, who forms the spirit of man within him, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. On that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot and a wood pile, like a flaming torch among sheaves. They will consume right and left all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first so that the honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great like the weeping of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shammai and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On that day I will banish the names of the idols from the land and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord God Almighty. I will remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. And if anyone still prophesies, his father and mother to whom he was born will say to him, you must die because you have told lies in the Lord's name. When he prophesies, his own parents will stab him. On that day every prophet will be ashamed of his prophetic vision. He will not put on a prophet's garment of hair in order to deceive. He will say, I am not a prophet. I am a farmer. The land has been my livelihood since my youth. If someone asks him, what are these wounds on your body? He will answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. Here ends the scripture reading for today. <laughs> and you can bet as we go into that today, um, there's quite a bit to cover and a, a number of different things, but hopefully we'll be able to see clearly. Um, Jesus Christ and what it means on that day. Um, before we uh, confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, I do want to remind you that we will do communion today. And so if you at home want to get some grape juice or grape juice, um, fruit of the vine, and some, some bread ready or some unleavened bread, that would be great um, in that way to have ready for the end of the service. But before we do that, and one of the things we want to do today is proclaim what we believe. So join me if you would. We'll use the Apostles' Creed like we so often do. But again, may we believe it and say it from our hearts. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our children's message today, um, we go on with things, and uh, you'll notice there that the title of the children's message is Family Forts, and uh, Tammy 
uh, saw my writing with this and she thought maybe it said family farts. <laughs> so we've got it online now. So it's the things that we, it's family forts, okay? Um, kids, what I want you to encourage you to do is to, uh, to make a fort. You ever made a fort? <laughs> you ever made a fort at home? Do make a fort at home. Get some chairs out. Get the blankets over. Get your mom and dad inside with something and, and do something. Maybe do family devotions inside a family fort one day. And uh, see, in the Bible, there's so many times that it mentions that God is our fortress. If you know what a real fortress is, you've probably seen maybe pictures of, can of, of castles, pictures of fortresses that way. Or maybe as a kid, some of you out there made fortresses. But we can be reminded that God is our fortress. And what you could do perhaps as a family is read Psalm 46, 1 through 3. Get in that fort, whether you have flashlights or maybe something that way or whatever way you want to do that. Get in that fort. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 46, 1. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. We will not fear. <laughs> Selah. <laughs> it's a wonderful psalm to read. And we can have confidence as a family, as people, that God, God is our fortress. He is the one we can look to. Verse 7 of that same psalm says, um, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You know, maybe as you're underneath there too, you can find the words to one of the songs in the hymnal a mighty fortress is our god and you can sit and you can sing it <laughs> in there we're not going to sing that song now before the message we're going to sing a different song that ties in with the message and the different things that way it's a song that's not in the hymnal it's a praise song that is, has a copyright that's come along um, 1995 with things that way but it's entitled, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And so I would ask that you'd sing it with here. Tammy's going to join me. We're going to sing it together. If you've never heard it before, take in these words as they proclaim what Christ has done for us and how deep his love is for us. And we're going to see that in our text today as well. So let's sing it together. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ 
his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from this reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. I hope you get a chance and I uh, would encourage you to maybe pull that song up sometime. Um, years ago, I think it was Phillips, Craig, and Dean were, were the first ones to put that one out. Um, as a song that they had taped and uh, it's a song that will stick around for a long time because it uh, has clear words and it points clearly to Jesus Christ and how deep his love is for you and for me. If you would turn your Bibles again uh, to Zechariah chapter 12. And we're going to spend our time there in Zechariah 12 and chapter 13. I will tell you when I looked at this passage in many commentaries it said this is one of the toughest passages in scripture to put into a time frame of things. You'll notice that I've entitled this, What a Difference a Day Makes. <laughs> That's the title of the message um, as we go forward. What a difference a day does make. Um, think about this day. Um, you can go online anytime you can uh, look up things that will, <coughs> excuse me, that will tell you this day in history. And you can find out different events. Well, most people will be watching this on November 8th, and it's meant for Sunday, November 8th. So I looked up November 8th. And just so you know, history pivots can pivot on a day, can't it? Someone is born who changes history. A battle might be fought. A, a law might be enacted. A discovery might be made, and everything changes. Every day is a gift from God. <laughs> And every day brings us to different things. November 8th is no different. Back in 1793 on November 8th, the Louvre, the Mu Louvre Mu Museum in Paris opened to the public for the very first time. All that artwork that was there. In 1805, November 8th, is the day that Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery, their expedition reached the Pacific Ocean, Pacific Ocean on that day. In 1895, William Rentgen, while experimenting with electricity, discovered the scientific principle that we now know as x-rays. And he took the very first x-ray pictures. That's changed a lot of lives, right? In 1910, William H. Frost patented, patented the insect exterminator. I wish I had that this week when it warmed up with the flies. In 1923, Adolf Hitler made his first attempt to seize power in Germany, and he had a failed coup. We know that later on, he changed history as well. In 1956, after turning down 18,000 different names, the Ford Motor Company decided to name their new car the Edsel, after Henry Ford's only son. Um, we now know the Edsel did not do so well. In 1965, on November 8th, I don't know if I should even do this one, but the soap opera Days of Our Life debuted on NBC. That probably changed a lot of lives too. Not necessarily in a good way. 1966, the next year, Ronald Reagan on November 8th was elected governor of California. Later on, he became our president. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush ordered more troop deployments in the Persian Gulf adding about 150,000 soldiers to the multinational force fighting against Iraq. You can see that many of these things make a difference. <laughs> in 2000, November 8th, 2000, in Florida, a statewide recount began to decide the winner of the 2000 U.S. presidential election. That's foremost on our minds and different things right now. Um, just for the fun of it, kids, just so you know, 
in 2009, 11 years ago, on November 8th, the game Angry Birds Star Wars was released. I know you're all thrilled about that as it goes along. There were some famous birthdays that are good to note. Edmund Haley, the astronomer and mathematician, was born in 1656 on November 8th. First to calculate that, that orbit of Halley's comet, but he also discovered many planets and different things. Patty Page, the singer, was born in 1927. Bonnie Raitt, the singer, in 1949. Mary Hart was born in 1951, the actress. And uh, that just gives you a few things. What a difference a day makes. One of the things that I want to point out as we look at Zechariah here is that we will see a phrase used very often. In fact, in these last three chapters of Zechariah, the phrase on that day is there 17 times. <laughs> now, what leads us up to this point? Well, Zechariah... Remember, in chapters 1 through 8, had the night visions that God gave him that were pointing the people that were rebuilding Jerusalem. And then in chapters 9 through 11, we had the first oracle, the prophetic sermon that was there. And the common theme of there was that the Lord is the shepherd of his people. And it ultimately point us to Jesus as the good shepherd. But now comes this last oracle with that repeat phrase, on that day. <laughs> And it focuses us on the climactic work of God in saving his people, in bringing salvation. When I talk about salvation, salvation comes in that way that God saves our souls, that God brings salvation through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But there's another aspect to salvation. There's the salvation at the end of time as well. It's tied in with the salvation and saving our souls because we are saved for now in this day and age while we live here on earth, but we are saved and we realize the full essence of salvation in eternity at the last day when Christ will come back again. We have fancy names for those things when we talk about it doctrinally. Justification is when we come and are saved when Christ proclaims us just, when we accept Him, we receive Him, when we trust in Him as our Lord and Savior. Then there's sanctification. God keeps working on us. We aren't saved by what we do, but God works on us and we begin to live out that salvation. And then there's glorification. When we come to the end of life, if we're believing in Christ, we will be glorified one day and we'll be with him for eternity. See, this day when Zechariah is referring to, he says on this day, he's referring to a day that's a time in the future, history for the people. Ultimately, the particular day of Christ's death on the cross, Christ's resurrection is a day that he's referring to, but it's also the day of Christ's second return. In reality, he's referring to that day, but he's also referring to every day in between. On that day, because that day might be the day for us to come to know Christ. It's a day of hope. Every day from the day Jesus came, from Christmas to his death his, to Good Friday and the resurrection on Easter Sunday, all the days that we have in there until he returns and ascends and come, he ascends into heaven, when he comes back again, it's a day of hope. It's a day that can be there for somebody to believe. And it gives us the key to the hope. It tells us the time of salvation and the time for salvation is today. Today is the day to believe. <laughs> That's the day that the prophet had in mind. And we're to be exhorted, as long as it's called today, if you hear the Lord's voice, don't harden your hearts, it says in Hebrews 4, 7. Now is the appointed time. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 
verse 2. Every day, we shouldn't put it off. Now is the time. The message is urgent. It offers us hope, but not hope that stretches on forever. It offers us hope for today, for the day. And soon the day will come to its conclusion. Soon the window of opportunity, as it were, will close and overtures of mercy offered to us in Jesus will be a thing of the past. Today, come to Christ. Today, repent and believe the gospel. Today, flee to Jesus. Today, get serious and do business with God. The time is short. Today is the day. Zechariah is saying, today is the day, but the day is almost over. The window of opportunity will close, and so the Lord will call you with offers of hope, with real urgency. Today, now, here, in this passage to do business with your Lord Jesus Christ, who is your Savior. And all that is said just by way of introduction today. As we look at these different things, what we're going to look at in the first nine verses is what God will do for us. (laughs) He keeps His people. By the way, as I'm thinking about days, I can't help but think about Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For you Norwegians out there, det der er dagen som Gud har skapt. It's the day that the Lord has made. This is the day. Yes, we're looking at Jesus coming. Yes, we are looking into His second coming. But we're looking at every day in between. What God will do for us in verses 1 through 9. What God will do in us in verses 10 through 14, and then in chapter 13, what God will do to us as we see these things. Let's start with what God will do for us. Look at those first nine verses of chapter 12. What God will do for us is that He will keep His people. Verse 1 of the text says, excuse me, it says, Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Zechariah is about to describe the life of God's people in terms, at least for the original hearers, those that are listening, perhaps for us also. He's explaining in such an expansive, such a far-reaching so conclusive and absolute in the extra, extraordinary claims that he's making. He prefaces his oracle and he helps us to remember that this is a message from God. This is a message from the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth and who forms the spirit of man within him. We know, we need to know about God's character toward us. Before we read the promises of God, we had better dust off our doctrine of God. (laughs) Or at least Zechariah is reminding us that here. What does God think of us? (laughs) Well, He gave us souls, didn't He? If you're struggling, if you've ever struggled to believe the promises of Scripture, maybe it's because we, when we do that, we tend to We tend to keep God too small. The measure of the reliability of God's promises toward us is not the strength of our faith in those promises, but the strength of God who makes the promises. We're being reminded God is the creator. He's the maker of all things. We just said that in the Apostles' Creed, didn't we? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. (laughs) We're being reminded that He's the sovereign Lord who rules even the hearts of men. He speaks reality into being. He sustains all things, upholding them by the word of His power. (laughs) One person put it this way. I, I like the way they put it. The biblical doctrine of God is the antidote to the deadly toxin of doubt. Do we need that today? (laughs) 
we need to get a clear picture of who God is, to know His promises. Who is God? <laughs> we're told in that verse, verse 1, and we're reminded of that to take hold of it in faith, that truth. <laughs> I want you to note, first of all, here is the first person of things starts to come into things. God starts to say, I will. I will. <laughs> and you have to understand the context. There's a terrible struggle that the people of God, here the people of Jerusalem, and as they've come back out of captivity, the Jewish people throughout history, but the people of God throughout time have had this hostility toward them the ongoing hostility of the world. I mean, we have enemies of our soul. It's our sinful nature. It's the worldly system out there that's been tainted with sin. And it's the devil. Those evil things are coming against us all the time, against the Christ, true Christian, the true believing church. The true believers, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. It's there. And that physical picture that's there for the Jewish people back at the time of Zechariah is also the spiritual picture that Christianity has been in and still is in to this day. And even the Jewish people, the people of God, have been persecuted throughout time. God here is assuring His people that no matter how intense the conflict and how hard-pressed they will be by the world's persecution. God will make them instrumental in overthrowing their persecutors. Look at the picture of God's people there in verse, verse 2. First of all, he says, I will make you a cup. I will make you a cup of trembling to all the people round about. God is going to use his people Look at verse 3. He says, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. <laughs> I think of the old kids' songs, I shall, I shall, I shall not be moved. <laughs> we have an immovable rock. Who is that immovable rock for us that gives us that solid foundation? Let me do a few verses for you really quick. Romans 16, 20 says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. God is going to give us that. He's the one who crushes Satan. Daniel chapter 2, 34 and 35, there is a rock that's not been made by human hands, not been cut out by human hands. And the picture that we see there in Daniel 4, 2 is that Daniel has that vision or that the king has the vision, and Daniel explains it, of this big statue that represents all the future kingdoms that will rule the world. But there's a rock that comes. It's not cut by human hands, and it strikes the bottom of that image and breaks it into pieces. Who's that rock? Scripture's pretty clear. Genesis 49, 24. Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. 1 Peter 2.8 refers to the rock as it quotes Isaiah 8.4. It says that there is a rock that has come that's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who don't believe. If you haven't figured it out already, it's Jesus, isn't it? Matthew 7, 24 and 25. We've said it so many times. Jesus said, if you hear these words of mine you, and you put them into practice, you'll be like that wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain will come, the streams go up against that house, but it will not fall because it has its foundation on the rock, on the word of God. And who's the word? Jesus. Peter said it very well when he made his proclamation that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God in Matthew 16. And Jesus said, upon this rock, upon this proclamation that you have made, Peter, that's what I will build my church. Upon Jesus, upon himself. 
And even in Zechariah, Zechariah 4, verse 7, in one of those visions, he says he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. And that capstone, that cornerstone is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The picture of God's people here is that we will be an immovable rock because we have an immovable rock as our foundation. Then in verse 4, he says, I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, but I will blind the horses of the nations. (laughs) The nations will not endure forever, but what will endure forever? The church, Christ's church, His people. There will always be a remnant because Christ is the foundation. And I love what it says in verse 5 of Zechariah 12. (laughs) The Lord Almighty is their God. (laughs) The strength to overthrow comes through the Lord. The Lord Almighty is their God. (laughs) He is where the strength, He is alone, is the source of the strength. He is the source of the invincibility. Then in verse (laughs) 6, He says, on that day I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile. You ever started a fire? Use a little fire pot or a little fire starter of some kind? That's the spark that's there, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. God's people will be. And they have been throughout time. And at the end of time, They will be too. Verses 7 through 9, he sums up in terms really of God giving salvation to his people, full and complete salvation. Specifically there in verse 8, he says, On that day the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them, so that the weakest among them will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. The feeblest, what a remarkable promise. The weakest, the feeblest of those will be like David. I like the way Francis Schaeffer put it. Francis Schaeffer said that in God's sight, there are no little people. (laughs) And there's no little places. For it's in our weakness that God makes us strong. On that day, God will keep his people. In Jesus, we will have the victory over sin, over death, over Satan. On that day, the gospel will go forth in advance, unstopped and triumphant. So we can be a part of that triumphant day when Christ comes back again. Let's go to the second point here as we go along. What will God, what God will do in us? And what God will do in us here is He will convert His people. He will convert. He'll bring about true conversion. Let's take a step back because Zechariah does a little bit here. And he puts down how God will work. (laughs) How God will work and how God will bring about that true conversion. He says there, how will God work? He says, there will be a spirit of grace and supplication that will be brought forth. (laughs) Look again there. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, verse 10, a spirit of grace and supplication. (laughs) Supplication is crying for mercy. How will God work? He will work through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of grace. The Spirit of God bringing forgiveness to us. The Holy Spirit that He left for those who believe. That will work in our hearts as we cry for God's grace, as we cry for His mercy. 
And God saves us by the work of God's grace and by the work of God's mercy, by Him not giving us what we deserve, by Him giving us more than we ever deserved. God brings life. He brings that new creation into us. We are saved by grace through faith in Him. God revives us by His grace and supplication. We cry out to Him. We need that fresh outpouring again and again and again. And we need to keep crying out. And what God brings then is a real conversion, a real, true conversion, a real relationship with Him. To reach sinners, the simple truth that they must is that we as sinners must see <laughs> We must see Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the next phrase of verse 10. It's really what it comes down to. He says there, and I want you to notice how it's in first person. This is God talking. They will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for me. We need to come to a point where we look on the one that we have pierced. We need to come to a point where we see that it's our sin that put him on the cross. It was at the cross that Jesus would be pierced for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. We can try all kinds of methods and mechanics and manipulations to get people saved, to get people converted, but what has to happen is that people need to come face to face with Jesus, the one they've pierced, the one that their sin put on the cross. <laughs> it's in John chapter 19, verses 31 through 37. I'm not going to read all those verses. It's the verses about how Jesus went to the cross for us, but it says there in verses 36 and 37, it's referring right to this passage. John writes, For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of Jesus' bones will be broken. And again, another Scripture says, They will look on Him whom they have pierced. They didn't break Jesus' bones. Usually they break the legs of the person on the cross so that they cannot breathe anymore and they die. But Jesus was already dead. So in, to see whether He was dead or not, they took the spear and pierced him through. And before you start to think, well, they didn't, they didn't pierce him to kill him, what did they put through his feet? What did they put through his hands? Jesus was pierced for you and for me. When the Spirit of God is poured out on sinners, how will they respond? <laughs> They will look upon the incarnate God. They will look upon Jesus who was pierced for them. And they begin to see it in a new way. Not just as a picture. Not just as some religious thing that they go do and see. No longer will they be able to shrug off the cross, the message of the gospel. They can't say that it's old news or it's just, oh, something I heard in Sunday school. No longer will they dismiss the crucified Christ as irrelevant. Now they will mourn and they will weep because they look upon the one they've pierced. And you and I begin to see what Jesus did for you and for me. No longer do we just see the fact of the cross but we began to see our sin that put him there. You know, we see that throughout history with the people up to this day and continuing on. Back in Acts 2.37, it says, when the people heard this, because Peter preached about a crucified Savior and how they had put him on the cross, it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? 
And Peter went on and many were saved that day. See, that's what, Pe- what, that's what Zechariah is talking about. They saw Christ crucified. They saw that their sin put them there. And the sin required this horror, this piercing, this death of Jesus for you and me. And it cut them to the heart. Dear friend, do you know anything of that heart cry as you see the reality of your sin? Can you say with the hymn writer that we sang earlier, Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. In verses 11 through 14, there's that intense conviction of sin as the weeping takes place. The weeping that took place and has taken place throughout history. Hopefully on that day, on the day of your salvation. Hopefully on that day, when Christ comes back again, it won't be too late for you. You know, the Bible says that one day every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. We read it in Romans 14, 11. We read it again in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, that at the name of Jesus, that day, on the day at the end of time, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the glory of God the Father. (laughs) I hope that you won't on that day be confessing because you haven't believed and you finally get to see Him. I hope it's because you've come to believe and trust in Him on that day, that day of salvation for you. I've told you the story that happened to me years ago in the Northwood Gym in Northwood, North Dakota as our girls had worked so hard playing basketball and they could never get the lead and at the end of the game they're down by one as Northwood shooting free throws and the the girl misses the first free throw and the Northwood girl misses the second free throw and our girls do what they're supposed to do they kick it out and our senior captain Carrie Miller lets fly just before the buzzer goes off from half court and the ball goes wide to the left the buzzer went it was the end of the game except that the Referee blew his whistle at the same time. She got to shoot free throws. Carrie Miller calmly made all three free throws. <laughs> we win by two. We didn't lead for all 32 minutes of that game. And it was at that moment, we were excited, jumping all our place, but at that moment God spoke to me. He said, that's not the way life is. When the buzzer goes for the end of, the li- end of life, you don't get that chance to shoot a free throw after the buzzer. One day everybody will bow before God. They will realize because they'll see the one they've pierced. But I hope that your weeping isn't the weeping that Jesus talked about in Matthew 8. Many will come from the east and the west. They'll recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the kingdom of heaven but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the other darkness. In that place, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All because you did not take a look at the one you've pierced and seen what he's done for you and simply let him be Lord. See, The last part I want to bring out just very quickly, and it leads us right into communion today. We'll sing right after this, but what will God do to us? It says there in chapter 13, verse 1, and I'm not going to go through all six verses because he gets rid of a lot of things. But what it brings, it says, On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and iniquity. 
that fountain that was open for you and me was the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed so that we could be forgiven. It was the picture throughout Scripture of every sacrifice, the blood that was put over the doorposts of the Lamb, the blood that was shed every time a lamb, a bull, a ram was killed. Pointed to the blood that would be shed for you and for me if we will just believe. We know what the Bible says if we confess our sins. He is faithful and He is just and He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's the cleansing that Jesus wants to bring that Zechariah was pointing the people to throughout time on that day, whatever that day could be, the day of salvation, but on that day at the end of all time. We're going to sing a song that points to that fountain in closing today. But I want to encourage you to come to that fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That's the good news if we will turn to him today. <laughs> Would you join me? Let's sing that song in closing. Um, actually, not in closing today, but we'll sing it before we go to communion, and we'll do the Lord's Supper and will receive his very body and blood today. So join me. Let's sing it together here as we finish out this part of the service. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Hey, wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. Till all the ransomed church of God Be saved to sin no more Be saved to sin no more Or be saved to sin no more Till all the ransomed church of God Be saved to sin no more ere since by faith i saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till i die and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. 
When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. We're reminded there that it was the day for the thief upon the cross. He got to see Jesus. I'd encourage you today to come to the Lord's table. At home, if you're doing this, that you would come as a sinner in need of God's grace again. Knowing what He's done for you, come believing and trusting that He can bring that salvation and has done it for you. If you would take the elements at home and have them ready, what makes this so powerful is not me doing this here today or you even doing it at home. It's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it's his word. As he sat with the disciples in the upper room, um, we read that he took the bread. When he broke it, he, he, he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And it says, after the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you would take the bread at this point, this is the body of Jesus Christ broken for you. And then if you would take the cup. This is the blood of Jesus that is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now given to you his holy body and blood. He has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace today. Walk with him day by day and know that when the day comes, when he comes again, that you will bow before him because he is your Savior, because he has done it for you. Go in his peace today and may God be with you till we meet again. We're going to close a little different today. We're going to sing a song in closing. We're doing it partly because it's a good reminder of for Veterans Day with things that it's kind of a patriotic song in certain ways, but it's a reminder really in this song of that day when Christ comes again. Let's sing it together, the battle hymn of the Republic. So join me if you would. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 
Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on.